By the end of 1941, RAF Bomber Command had a problem. Their losses were mounting, and yet despite missions being flown at night and using unpredictable flight paths, the Germans always seemed to know they were coming, making them easy prey for their fighters and anti-aircraft guns. The British had long suspected that they had a basic radar capability, but what they didn't know was that they had developed a new, more advanced radar. If the British failed to find out the secrets of this new German radar, then it could have disastrous consequences for RAF Bomber Command. It would take the combination of air, land and sea forces to carry out this most daring of missions. By 1941, much of Britain's focus was on strategic bombing. Following the fall of France and the evacuation of Allied troops from Dunkirk in the summer of 1940, and later that same year the success of the Battle of Britain, RAF Bomber Command was sending waves of bombers across Germany and its occupied territories. However, in 1941, bomber losses were on the increase, and although it was generally accepted that Germany was developing radar, not everyone in British intelligence accepted that the Germans had an effective and deployed radar capability. Throughout the 1930s, and indeed earlier than that, there were many nations independently researching, in top secret, the concepts of radar, and notably, a British team led by Robert Watson Watt was able to introduce an effective, albeit rudimentary, radar system by the start of World War II in 1939. It was imperative that Britain had a better understanding of the radar capabilities of Germany. So in 1939, Reginald Victor Jones, a British radar scientist, was appointed as Britain's first scientific intelligence officer. His brief? Find out exactly how advanced German radar was in comparison with that of Britain. As part of his work, he studied leaked German documents, decoded Enigma messages, crashed German aircraft, and interrogated German prisoners of war. The evidence he gathered soon began pointing to the fact that Germany did indeed have an effective and deployed radar system, and that it was actively transmitting high-frequency radio signals over Britain from somewhere on the near continent. The search was now on to find these installations. The first evidence to come into Jones's hands was supplied by Flight Lieutenant Thomas Sneam. On the evening of the 21st of June 1941, he was flying a de Havilland Hornet Moth along with co-pilot Kjell Pedersen over the Danish coast, when he was able to photograph two German radar installations on the island of Farnu. Further photographs of similar installations taken by the RAF near Cap d'Antifer in Normandy showed 20 foot wide, or 6 meter wide, rotating mattress antenna mounted in circular emplacements. These photos provided concrete evidence of the Freya radar system. Now that Jones and his team had photographs to study, they could set about designing countermeasures, and now that the RAF knew what they looked like, they could seek out and destroy them. The decrypted Enigma codes also gave suggestion of another key piece of equipment that did not fit the description of the Freya radar array, and this gave Jones a bit of a headache. The Enigma messages refer to something called Wurzburg, and it was integral to the whole radar system. In November of 1941, Jones got a breakthrough. An RAF photo reconnaissance aircraft had discovered and captured images of a 10 foot diameter, or 3 meter diameter, parabolic antenna. Jones concluded that this was the Würzburg radar system. The two systems were designed to work as a complementary pair. The Freya radar was a long-range early warning system that did not have great accuracy, but the Würzburg was a shorter-range system with high accuracy and it was used to direct Luftwaffe fighters onto the approaching bombers. In order to develop effective countermeasures against this system, it was essential that Jones and his team got their hands on a Würzburg radar to study it more closely. Unfortunately, all of the installations so far discovered were quite far inland, and therefore not ideal for a raid. But Jones had a stroke of luck when an RAF Spitfire of No. 1 Photo Reconnaissance Unit spotted an active installation whilst flying over the French coast near Le Havre. 12 miles, or 19 kilometers, north of La Havre sits the French village of Brunval. Immediately to the north of Brunval, sitting on a cliff top, was what Jones was after, an operational Würzburg radar system just meters from the English Channel. 
Seizing this equipment would require a combined effort, so a request was made to the commander of combined operations, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten. Following a brief discussion with the Chiefs of Staff Committee, Lord Mountbatten gave the go-ahead. The raid was on. At first glance, it may have seemed that the site was fairly exposed, out in the open and right on the coastline of the English Channel, and therefore ripe for a quick smash and grab. However, German coastal defences were extensive in that area, and the site's position on the cliff top was some 350 feet, or 107 metres, above the shore. A seaborne assault would have been far too hazardous, and the time taken to get troops up from the beach would have been far too long, giving the Germans more than enough time to destroy the radar before the British could get anywhere near it. Above all else, the cost in casualties would have been unacceptable. To maintain the element of surprise and minimise potential casualties, Lord Mountbatten decided that an airborne assault was the only option. The general outline of the plan would be for airborne troops to be parachuted in, overpower and secure the site, dismantle key components from the Würzburg radar and then evacuate the area to the beach where landing craft would be waiting to carry the troops and the valuable radar cargo back across the channel to England. On the 8th of January 1942, Lord Mountbatten contacted Major General Frederick Browning, commander of the 1st Airborne Division, to ask if such a raid could be undertaken. The 1st Airborne Division had only formed a few months earlier in late 1941 as a response to the success of German airborne infantry operations during the Battle of France. And Browning saw Mountbatten's request as an ideal opportunity to not only boost the morale of his troops, but also to demonstrate what his men could achieve, and he was therefore suitably enthusiastic. A window of opportunity in late February was chosen, as the weather forecast looked favourable, as well as a full moon and high tides. Both Mountbatten and Browning believed that training could be completed in this relatively short space of time, so training began immediately. The aircraft for the operation would be supplied from 38-wing RAF, which was a newly formed unit of the Royal Air Force under the command of Group Captain Sir Nigel Norman. As the unit was so new, its own allocated aircraft were not yet operational, and so No. 51 Squadron, under the command of Wing Commander Percy Charles Picard, would supply Armstrong Whitworth Whitley aircraft. The Whitley was a British twin-engine bomber aircraft, which had been in service with the RAF since 1937, and as well as a bomber, it had been the standard paratroop transport since 1940. The 1st Airborne Division was still in its infancy and consisted only of two parachute battalions, and only one of those, the 1st Parachute Battalion, was fully trained. Major General Browning didn't want to risk the 1st Parachute Battalion in case they were called upon for a larger operation, so he ordered the 2nd Parachute Battalion to provide a company for the operation, despite the fact that many of the men had yet to complete their parachute jumping course. This company, C Company, was commanded by Major John Frost. Training began on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, before travelling north to Inverary in Scotland, where they would practice night embarkations on landing craft to prepare for the evacuation by sea from the beach below the radar installation after the raid. Following this, they returned south back to Wiltshire to join up with 51 Squadron and its Whitley aircraft to begin their parachute training. Whilst this training was going on, Major Frost met up with Commander Frederick Norton Cook of the Royal Australian Navy. Commander Cook was in charge of not only the naval force and landing craft for the evacuation, but also 32 men from No. 12 Commando. These men would arrive on the landing craft and supply covering fire for C Company as they evacuated the beach. Also entering the operation at this stage was RAF Flight Sergeant Charles William Hall Cox. He was a radio and radar specialist and he had volunteered to join C Company on the raid. His knowledge and skills would be essential in capturing and dismantling the Würzburg. And finally, ten men from the Royal Engineers. Six sappers would assist Flight Sergeant Cox in dismantling the radar, while another four would plant anti-tank mines on the perimeter of the site to protect from counter-attack. For the operation to be a success, it was imperative that the British planners knew the layout of the German defences, both at the site itself, but also the evacuation beach. Central to this intelligence was the French resistance, and in particular Gilbert Renault, known to the British as Remy. Thanks to Remy and members of his resistance cell, the British knew that the site was made up of two main areas. 
The first was a villa, sitting approximately 91 metres from the cliff edge, which held the radar station. The Würzburg antenna being just outside between the villa and the cliff. The villa was staffed by Luftwaffe radar technicians and surrounded by guard posts. The second area was a small enclosure of small buildings, which acted as a garrison for up to 100 German troops and radar technicians. In the nearby town of Brunval was a platoon of German troops, whose job was to man the beach defences from pillboxes and machine gun nests. And there was also a mobile infantry reserve further inland which could be called upon. With this intelligence, Major Frost divided C Company into five sections, each being named after a notable Royal Navy Admiral. Nelson, Jellicoe, Hardy, Drake and Rodney. Nelson was to deploy to the beach and eliminate the German defences in readiness for the evacuation. Rodney was placed between the radar site and the road that would likely be used for an enemy counterattack as a defensive line. This left Jellicoe, Hardy and Drake to capture the radar site, the villa and the enclosure. The plan was set and codenamed Operation Biting. Late February and the window of opportunity had arrived and after a few postponements due to bad weather, on the afternoon of Friday the 27th of February, Commander Cook set sail with his naval force into the English Channel. And later that evening, at RAF Thruxton in Hampshire, 51 Squadron were loading 12 Armstrong Whitworth Whitleys with C Company of the 2nd Parachute Battalion, and by 10.30pm they were airborne and climbing out on a path to occupied France. The journey across the English Channel passed without a hitch, but when they approached the French coastline, they came under considerable anti-aircraft fire. Fortunately, this fire was not very effective and the squadron of Whitley's continued undamaged. Most of the paratroopers successfully landed within the drop zone, but unfortunately half of the Nelson detachment landed short by a couple of miles and south of Brunval. Once all the troops had landed, they gathered their equipment and made for the rendezvous point. From there, the raid began. Jellicoe, Hardy and Drake moved to surround the villa and when in position, Major Frost gave the order to open fire and they moved in. A German guard on the first floor returned fire from an upstairs window but he was quickly engaged and killed. The remaining Germans inside the villa were taken prisoner and after interrogation, they revealed that the majority of the garrison were actually stationed further inland. Good news for C Company. But despite this, there was still a sizeable threat from the small enclosure of buildings next to the villa. The gunfire had alerted the troops positioned there and they began to open fire on C Company, killing one of the raiders in the process. And as the firefight intensified, Major Frost saw enemy vehicles in the distance closing in on Rodney section, which was tasked with the perimeter defence. He was unable to contact them because the radios they had been supplied failed to work. This communications problem also meant that Frost was unaware that half of Nelson were yet to arrive and the beach defences were not being cleared. Despite all of this, Flight Sergeant Cox and his assistant sappers of the Royal Engineers were setting about dismantling the radar equipment and placing it on specially designed trolleys and when this was complete, Frost ordered the withdrawal to the evacuation beach. As they were descending the hillside to the beach, they came under fire from a German machine gun nest. It was now very apparent to Frost that the beach had not yet been secured by Nelson. He ordered Rodney and the understrength Nelson to secure the beach while he led the other three sections back to the villa for cover. When Jellicoe, Hardy and Drake had arrived back at the villa, they realised that it had been retaken by the enemy and so following a brief engagement it was back in British hands. Having allowed sufficient time for the beach to have been secured, Frost once again led his men down the hillside towards the beach. The German machine gun nest this time however was silent as it had been destroyed by the missing element of Nelson who had now arrived on scene following their perilous run through German occupied Brunval. It was now 0215 and having secured the beach, Frost was scanning the water for the landing craft but there was no sign. Commander Cook had also been experienced in communication problems made worse by also trying to avoid German naval patrols that were operating in the same stretch of water. To attract Cook's attention, Nelson was ordered to cover the inland approaches to the beach while a signal flare was fired. To Frost's relief, soon after firing the flare, the landing craft arrived, all six landing at the same time. With Nelson returning fire to the German soldiers that had now arrived on the hillside, the commandos boarded their landing craft. The Würzburg radar, 
the German prisoners and the commandos were now heading back into the English Channel. However, six were left behind and they were captured and became prisoners. The journey back to England was accompanied by four Royal Navy destroyers and a flight of RAF Spitfires and was therefore uneventful. Operation Biting was complete. The whole operation was deemed to be a complete success for several reasons. First, a successful raid against German occupied territory was a welcome morale boost for the British public, but also that airborne troops were shown to be highly effective. This prompted the War Office to continue the expansion of its airborne forces, including the formation of the Parachute Regiment later that same year. But the most important reason was the capture of the Würzburg radar itself. The technical knowledge gained was invaluable to British scientists in their study of German radar capabilities. Further studies showed that it was resistant to jamming techniques that were being used at that point, and so led on to the development of a countermeasure called Window, what today we call Chaff, and it is still in use. 19 decorations were awarded as a result of Operation Biting, including Major John Frost, the Military Cross, Commander Frederick Norton Cook, the Distinguished Service Cross, Flight Sergeant Charles William Hall Cox, the Military Medal, and there were also several mentions in dispatches. The casualties were relatively light on both sides. The British had two paratroopers killed in action, eight wounded, and six captured as prisoners. The Germans had five killed in action, two wounded, five missing, and a number captured and transported back to England for interrogation. The cost of the French resistance is unknown, although there is confirmation of at least one member being executed by the Germans for his part in the intelligence gathering. It is fair to say that without the sacrifice of the French resistance, and Gilbert Renault particularly, Operation Biting may have had a very different outcome. <laughs>